Hey guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at the Great Depression and kind of some of the causes um, that went through with that. Uh, so let's just kind of remind ourselves where we are uh, at this time period, right? So we're just coming off of the 1920s. So let's think about some of the qualities of the 1920s. We've got um, this mass consumer culture, all that advertising and everything that we looked at, um, where what we've got are people buying these luxury items, goods they don't necessarily need. A lot of people are buying on credit. So it's the same thing as buying with a credit card. If you buy with a credit card, you don't have the cash on hand, right? Um, you have to pay it off later. So that's what a lot of people in the 20s are doing. Um, it's this era of luxury, of extravagance right? Um, but if you look under the scenes of the 1920s, there's some stuff kind of going on behind the scenes that are going to lead to the crash um, of the economy into what becomes one of the worst economic problems in our nation's history, um, which is the Great Depression. So today we're going to be looking at kind of how that happened. Um, so you should have a worksheet that looks like this. It says the coming of the Great Depression at the top. Um, so we're going to see what those causes are. We've got seven major causes of the Great Depression here. Um, so some of this is going to be kind of complicated stuff. So um, make sure you're paying close attention as we're going through this. So the first thing that we have is low crop prices. And this actually goes back um, to a World War I. Okay? So during World War I, remember Herbert Hoover was in charge of the U.S. Food Administration. And during the war, they doubled food production uh, in order to get supplies overseas, right? So this is what farmers were doing. We're increasing their production, increasing how much food they were growing. And supply was high, but demand was high. Right. So if you've ever seen a supply and demand chart, which you may not have, let's just take a look at this here really quickly. So if you look when demand is high, right, these little points on the chart refer to price and quantity. Right. So when demand is high, price is high. Right. However, if supply is high, price is low. OK, so during the war, demand was high price is high. However, after the war, demand dropped, okay? As demand drops, the prices drop, all right? So after the war, there is this oversupply and lower prices, all right? So crop prices are dropping, and they're dropping rapidly, all right? But farmers are still producing the same amount. But the problem is farmers can't pay their debts. Remember, farmers are almost always in debt. Farmers are unable to pay their debts. And if farmers are unable to pay their debts, what is going to happen to their farm? They are going to lose it. When they can't pay their debts, then the banks take their farms, foreclose on their farms. And suddenly you've got all these farmers who are unemployed, right? So just a couple pictures here. Um, this is just a sign advertising a farm foreclosure. You can see that um, it's pretty desolate, right? Um, this is a foreclosure sale. So this farm is going up for auction. All these men are here to buy um, the farm. So a lot of farmers are losing their livelihood during the 1920s. That's a major problem that we're going to see. Um, the next is the distribution of income in general. So we say about the distribution of income, that's like how many rich people are there and how many poor people are there. So during the 1920s, do you think that there was a high or low percentage of poor to rich? All right. Well, during the 20s, the rich are getting richer. Think about Great Gatsby, right? Think about Gatsby and all those rich people in that movie. People who are rich are playing the business game, right? They're continuing to get richer. What do you think is happening to the poor people? All right, they're getting lower, right? So there's this anti-labor attitude. We talked about this. Why are they afraid of labor in the 1920s? This whole idea of communism, right? So there's this anti-labor attitude. Labor unions are unpopular. When labor unions are unpopular, wages get lower. Remember, there's no government regulation on business, really, in the 1920s. Think about Calvin Coolidge and Warren G. Harding. Their thing is um, no government regulation. So that is going to lead to lower wages. Um, so the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. The effect of this is the poor can't afford new products. So all this new 1920s commercialism idea, poor people in the country are not able to buy those new things. Is that going to stop companies from making those new things? What do you think? No, it's not. In fact, that effect is the cause of rising inventories. So when we talk about rising inventories, basically if you think about businesses like Ford, okay? So Ford keeps making cars. 
The problem is, as the 20s progress, fewer and fewer people are buying those cars, but they're not slowing production. They keep making the same number, maybe even increasing the number of cars that they're making. But because people are losing jobs, because wages are low, people can't afford to buy these new things. So basically the storeroom at the Ford warehouse has got more cars in it than they can sell, right? We also have high tariffs. This means that because there are all these high tariffs, we're not selling a lot to other countries because it's too expensive for other countries um, to buy our goods. So not only are our people not buying our goods, other countries are not buying our goods, okay? So high tariff means low exports. So again, what we might have been selling overseas, we are now not selling overseas, all right? So as these inventories keep rising, factories are gonna have to start cutting off production. And when you start cutting off production, that's when you start laying people off. And so when you lay people off, what's that gonna do to unemployment? It's gonna go up, right? Well, kind of going back to this whole tariff issue, um, there are some major imbalances, right? So other nations start raising their tariffs too. So our tariffs are high, but other nations start raising their tariffs as well. This is going to mean that we are not able to sell as much on the foreign trade market and foreign trades are not buying. So global trade starts coming to a standstill. One of the elements of the 19 or of the 20th century is that economies are depending on global trade. However, with countries not buying goods, it's going to affect the economies of all of the countries around the world. So global trade starts to slow down way fast, okay? Then in the 1920s, um, it, we have the stock market crash. This is probably the thing that most of you are familiar with, right? Um, October 29th, 1929, um, it's known as Black Tuesday, right? Um, so here's what happens, okay? During the 1920s, people are encouraging you to buy stocks. Stocks are overvalued and people are buying them on the margin. Let me explain what this means. So if you're not sure how the stock market works, the stock market is all about purchasing a part of a company, okay? So we're gonna pretend that this monopoly cards, right? These are the stocks in a company. So we're gonna pretend that the company is McDonald's, okay? So this is the stocks of McDonald's. So for each one of these that you buy, right? You own a percentage of McDonald's. So if I buy three stocks, I own 3% of McDonald's, right? So the stock market is a great way to invest your money. Um, if a company does well, the stocks go up. If a company does poorly, the stocks go down and you lose money, okay? But here's what people were doing in the 20s. So let's say these stocks for McDonald's really should cost about $5 per share, right? Per share per stock. However, McDonald's is selling them at $10 a share. Well, let's say I want to own a pretty good percentage of the company. I want to buy a thousand shares in McDonald's. Okay. So $10 a share, thousand shares, um, you know, that's $10,000, right? Well, I don't have $10,000. I only have $5,000. So this is $5,000. So I want to buy 10,000 or 1,000 of these, but I can only afford half of that. So I go to a broker. All right. And what I do is I say, hey man, I want to buy a thousand shares of McDonald's, but I can only buy half of them. Will you give me a loan for the rest of it? So that guy goes, sure, you know, here you go. So here's the other $5,000. So add that, I can now buy $10,000 worth of shares, okay? So the idea is when I make money, if my stocks go up in value, I will be able to pay back the stockbroker, give him back the money that he loaned to me to buy this extra stocks, okay? Well, that's great if the stock value goes up. But remember, the stocks are already overvalued. So what happens if the price of the stocks go down? Well, then I lose money, right? I don't have the money to pay him back. Is my money slowly going away? But he's going to start calling his loan. That broker, he needs, he needs his money too, right? He needs his loan back. So that broker's going to come to me and say, I need back that $5,000 that I lent you. Well, I don't have that $5,000 anymore. 
Well, that's great. But neither does the next guy or the next guy or the next guy, right? So this is all about paying back a loan that I can't pay back. And the problem is everybody has done this, right? It's the speculation in the stock market. It's like a risky, like a gamble in the stock market. And everybody's doing this. So all of a sudden, people start calling in their loans and nobody has the money to pay back those loans. And in one day, the value of stocks go from maybe $10 a share to 50 cents a share to 10 cents a share. And I can't pay that back. And nobody can pay that back. And that's going to lead to Black Tuesday, the stock market crash in 19, October 1929. And a lot of people consider this to be the event that really starts the Great Depression. Um, so the effect here is when stock values fall, people can't pay back those loans, pay back the banks, right, those loans, right? So what's going to happen if the bank can't get the money that they own, right? Well, they don't have any money either. So when people can't pay back the banks, this is going to lead to the next event, okay? So just really quickly here, this is just a picture that emphasizes what I was saying again. So if you look down here at the bottom, um, the stock value for 1,000 shares is $10 each, right? I put in my 5,000. The broker puts in his 5,000. This guy over here, right, this fancy businessman, he puts in his 5,000. The point being that if the price goes up, you look at the second column, the price goes up, I will be able to make a profit and pay back this guy. However, if the stock value falls, I can't, right? So that money I put in, I don't have anymore, and I can't pay him back, right? So that's what it means to buy on the margin. So um, when people cannot pay back their brokers, they cannot pay back the banks, all right? So the first thing that we have is all these people are borrowing money and they can't pay it back, right? Well, see, here's the thing about the banks, right? People think of the banks as having like a major vault in the back where they hide all the money, right? But that's not what happens. If I go and I take my $1,000 and I give it to the bank, right? They put it into my account and I put that money into the bank. Well, then Joe from down the street comes in and he wants to take out $1,000 from his account. So they go into the vault and that $1,000 that I just put in, they give to Joe, right? Well, let's say the next guy wants his $1,000, right? Well, they go and they do that. So the money that you deposit in the bank does not represent your money. The idea being that when people make loans or buy get loans from the banks, when they pay that back, eventually there'll be enough money in the banks that everybody can get the money they need when they need it, right? Well, here's the problem. When people start realizing that the banks are running out of money, they want to get all their money out of the bank, right? Like, I've got $1,000 in that bank. I want it back. So you start hearing a rumor that this bank is shutting down. I want to go get my $1,000 out of the bank, right? So I run to the bank to get my $1,000 out, but so does Joe and, you know, Gene and Melissa and everybody else, right? So everybody runs to the bank, and this is what we call a bank run, right? So thousands of people flock to these banks, and everybody wants to withdraw everything they have. But the bank doesn't have a vault in the back where everything is in there, right? So when people start asking for their money, the banks don't have enough money to give everybody their money, right? So banks start to close. Well, what happens to my $1,000 that I put in the bank? If I didn't get to the bank fast enough, my $1,000 is gone, right? I'm not getting that back. I'd have been safer off keeping $1,000 in a jar in my house because... The bank lost it. That's scary, right? Now, this, uh, this cannot happen today. It's just there are securities set up today. But this was happening all over the country at this time. People are just crowding to the banks. It's called run on the bank, trying to get their money out. And the first few people might get it, but the last few people are not, right? So people are losing their entire life's savings in one go. That's crazy to think about, right? 
So this is, of course, going to lead to some failures in other parts of it, right? So as soon as people start um, losing their money, these small businesses can't get these short-term loans from the banks, right? So businesses run on loans. Banks close, businesses can't get loans. Well, when small businesses close, or when small businesses can't get loans, and then they can't pay their back their loans, then they have to close. So that's going to lead to a rise in unemployment. So we've already had production is lowering, so they're laying off people. Farms are being foreclosed off, so they're losing unemployment. Now small businesses are um, closing up, so unemployment is rising there too. People are losing their life savings in the bank, and this all happens in just a matter of a few weeks, and the entire country starts to panic. Right? This is going to be a major, major issue um, as people are trying to figure out what to do and how to solve this problem. Okay, um, So we'll talk more about kind of some of the effects of these causes in class, but this is just a brief little overview of how the Great Depression starts. And I hope you can see kind of like the snowball effect. So like one leads to the other, right? So the low crop prices lead to an in increase in the distribution of income, which leads to the imbalance in rising inventories, which leads to the imbalance in trade, which leads to the stock market crash. So you can kind of see how this starts to snowball onto each other. Um, so I will see you guys in class as we talk a little bit more about the Great Depression. Bye.